Ah, time to pay this bloody water bill, I suppose. Oh, right. Card number. Nah. Yeah. There. Authorising? Authorising? Hey. Wow. So there is. Anyway, video. Hello, welcome to the fifth video in the Evolutionary Ecology series, and I'd like to start off by giving you a bit of a warning. Okay? Today's video is on functional genes and adaptive evolution. I'm not going to lie, it's going to get pretty dense, okay? So I hope your brain switched on for this one, for some hardcore genetics. Basically, we're going to be looking at the genetic basis, and we're going to be seeing how we've identified specific genes that have been important in evolution, and how we can track um, selection of these genes through time. And of course, we're going to be looking at how we've been able to do that in the first place, okay? So first thing, just to set out, is that there's two main types of genes that selection can act upon, okay? There's the functional coding genes, which actually produce a protein product and create the phenotype, basically. But then there's also regulatory genes, which, if anything, are more important. So regulatory genes regulate the expression of other genes, okay? Now, you can get regulatory genes which regulate other regulatory genes, which regulate functional genes, and so on. So it's extremely complex. And these regulatory genes tend to be in close physical contact with these functional coding genes. They're usually upstream of them in um, the genome. Now we can study this by looking at our classic examples of Darwin's finches and Lake Malawi cichlids. So firstly, Darwin's finches, Absan et al. did a study in 2004 looking at craniofacial morphology. And he found out that gene expression was very much related to the ecology of certain Darwin's finch species. Specifically, he identified this gene, BMP4. And he worked this out by doing what's called an in-situ hybridization. Basically, he got a section of tissue from these Darwin's finches. He already made a cDNA probe with a little fluorescent tag on it. He poured it over this tissue, and that would have shown where this BMP4 was being expressed. Right? And it was shown that it was more highly expressed in birds with larger beaks. Now what's interesting is that these same genes can be equally important in completely different animal taxa. If we then look at cichlids in a study done by Albertson et al. in 2005, he looked at these two different cichlid species, which I'm going to have trouble saying, we're going to have a go. So Labiotrophus fuelleborni and Mylandia zebra. Basically what he did was an expansion of the Darwin Finch experiment. He did a hybridization cross so he um, hybridized these two species together to produce an F1 generation. But as I mentioned in the previous video, that F1 generation doesn't really tell you much. It's just a mix of genes. To separate out these different alleles, which could be important, then you need to cross them again. So what you do, you do that again, and then you've got an F2 generation. Now, within this F2 generations, this is where you can make pretty interesting correlations between the frequency of specific alleles and the morphologies that we see. Because F2 generations gives you a whole spectrum of different morphologies where alleles are segregated. And what is interesting is that the gene BMB4 does seem to be correlated in this case. Right? So then another in situ hybridization experiment was carried out and it was found that the species with um, the pointy jaw, so Lebiotrophus fuelleborni, um, expressed very little BMP4 in comparison to Mylandia zebra. Therefore, environmental pressures can stimulate different patterns of gene expression. Now, another we must question is whether this variation has some older origin. Because, of course, for a new mutation to just suddenly arise out of nowhere and be selected for, 
Well, that is going to be a lot slower than if this variation was here in the first place. Okay, so standing genetic variation is inevitably going to lead to faster evolution. So this is why we've been talking about it. genetic variation is so important for selection to happen. And this is particularly useful when in a variable environment, because it allows organisms to adapt more quickly. A famous example comes from the study of the EDA genes, and <laughs> no prizes for guessing what it is, it's a bloody stickleback again, isn't it? Now, this is a bit complicated, so we're going to take it slow. In fact, I may take my fleece off because I might get a bit hot and bothered. But let's have a go. Right, so sticklebacks can be found in marine and freshwater habitats. And in the marine environments, we see that they're more heavily armoured. Okay, they've got a tougher outer layer. Whereas in the freshwater environment, not so much. Okay, that's step one. Similarly to what was done in the cichlids, an F2 hybridization cross was produced and they looked at, I think, a 400 kilobase long section of a chromosome and they identified this microsatellite, okay, STN365, <laughs> okay, don't ask me why, um, and this was found to be correlated with the armoured phenotype, okay. But what's interesting is that this microsatellite is right next to this EDA gene. And that was discovered by Colissimo et al. in 2005. So then Barrett et al. in 2009 took this one step further. He created just an F1 cross this time, which produced heterozygotes of the EDA gene. Yeah? So on one of the chromosomes, there was an EDA gene. On another one, there wasn't. Okay, and they release these sticklebacks into semi-natural environments and watch to see how well they got on. And these semi-natural systems were fresh water. And what they found was, is that over time there was an increase in this EDA allele, but then a drastic decrease. Okay, and this drastic decrease was due to that F2 offspring being produced. Now, EDA is the low armoured allele, so if you're homozygous for EDA, then you're likely to have low armour, like any fish in fresh water would, okay, because the ones in the marine environment are heavily armoured. So therefore, in a fresh water environment, you'd expect the frequency of this EDA allele to increase, to decrease the amount of armour, okay. Now, the reason why armoured sticklebacks don't do so well in fresh water is because in fresh water, there's less calcium around, okay? And that um, presents a really big constraint on growth of these sticklebacks. So that means if these sticklebacks can't grow as well, that means they're less likely um, to win in competition for mates and therefore less likely to breed and pass on their genes. Because that calcium is important for producing that armoured phenotype. Yeah? So there's sort of an interaction here between the genetic basis of the armoured phenotype and how the environment affects it as well. Now, the next step to do is to look at the phylogeny of the EDA genes. Now, we know that sticklebacks in the Pacific are more closely related to each other than sticklebacks found in the Atlantic. So that means freshwater and marine species don't actually form a monophyletic group. So what you could do is build a phylogeny using only the EDA gene and see whether it has evolved multiple times. Because if it has evolved multiple times, then that's a good sign of adaptive evolution. Because if there's particularly strong selection on a particular gene, that would mean it would show a phylogeny which matches the phenotype. That's exactly what they showed, but not completely, because they found within the armoured clade that was formed by just using the EDA gene, there was one unarmoured species in there. So there could be loads of different factors involved here. We can then go and see what positions in these genes are responsible for that variation that we see in the phylogeny. And that is exactly what was done by Colissimo et al. And they identified six SNPs, six 
single nucleotide polymorphisms are identified, which corresponded to the observed phenotypes. Because, of course, within these armoured species, there's a whole spectrum, they're not all the same. So, are there any particular areas of these genes which um, particular mutations have happened that are important in those armoured phenotypes? So, it's taken an even more fine-grained view of things, right? Now, of course, with modern technology advancing, it's now possible to sequence entire genomes. So we can get a better look, because obviously EDA is only one gene, surely loads that are responsible for producing this armoured phenotype. So Jones et al. looked into this further. And just like in the study that we talked about um, with the cichlids in Lake Masoko last time on sympatric speciation, what you get is, is when you sequence these genomes and look for genes that are responsible, you get loads of peaks clumped together. And these are a mixture of functional and regulatory genes, but also other genes which don't seem to be related, that have just been carried along through the process of genetic hitchhiking that we've been talking about. And once these genes were identified, actually it was found that only 17% of them were coding genes. So that emphasises even further that we were talking about at the start of the video, how it's these regulatory genes which are particularly important um, during selection. Okay? Because they can potentially affect the expression of loads of different phenotypes. So we've demonstrated, as we probably knew before, that it's not just as simple as one gene affecting one trait. There are loads of genes involved. What's interesting is that most of these are regulatory genes. But can these genes act additively together? And there have been various studies looking at that, again on fish. <laughs> um, a study on cichlids in the Vancouver Lakes, where, as we've talked about before, there's a benthic and a limnetic form. So once again, another F2 hybrid cross was carried out, which produced 633 hybrids, and these were taken and harvested in semi-natural conditions. And what they measured was, they measured the body size of these fish, and this was shown to be a good measure of fitness. Now, just like in that study that we talked about um, a few episodes ago by Martin and Wainwright, um, looking at pup fishers, this is another good example of, of demonstrating the adaptive landscape. Because there was definitely shown to be a fitness valley of hybrid forms, where individuals which were intermediates that only had some of the genes didn't seem to do so well. So, after a lot of genotyping and sequencing, and specific genes were identified, it was shown that genes, for example, that affected benthic lifestyles, if individuals had more of those genes, they were more likely to do well. So therefore, genotype definitely predicts ecology during an ecological speciation event. Okay. So that's interesting. Now let's move away from fish. <laughs> We're sick of them. Let's look at Florida beach mice instead. Okay, where there are different morphs which can occur in sympatry, but these morphs differ on their coat colour. So there's a mainland mouse which is brown, and a Santa Rosa mouse which is white. Okay, and this is shown to be related um, to the environment, the substrate in which they live. Okay, so they match the substrate. So basically, these different colours are used for camouflage. And this was shown by Vigneri et al. in 2010, who did a manipulation experiment and calculated um, the extent of predation of mice on different colours when put against the wrong background. So, guess what happened next? F2 offspring were produced and alleles were identified. And this particular one was shown to be important. MC1R gene. And then this gene has two alleles, only two, which is quite neat. Okay, now after a much wider screen, because it's likely that there are, it's not just the MC1R gene, right? So a much wider screen was carried out uh, by Steiner et al. And he identified this gene, the agouti gene. It was a bit confusing because, of course, the agouti is um, a small mammal, a rodent. It's quite a large rodent that lives in South America, but it's also the name of a gene, okay? So, the Agouti gene was found to be of interest. And after further inspection, it was shown that this gene 
was a regulatory gene of MC1R. This was shown in nature because there seemed to be a, a simultaneous shift of expression of agouti and MC1R with the environment that these mice were in. So could this be happening in other species as well? Well, Rosenblum et al. in 2010 looked at white sand lizards, which also have different morphs, um, different colour morphs for particular environments. And she targeted the MC1R gene and looked to see whether these differences were the same as what we saw with the Florida beach mice. Now, there are three species of these lizards which show similar colour variations within the species. And they found that all the substitutions that were seen in the MC1R gene, the MC1R gene was shown to be important, but see, these substitutions were occurring in different places on that MC1R gene. So that suggests there are loads of different ways in which you can get colour morphs, in which you can get this variation. So therefore, parallel evolution does seem to be occurring in this case, but not necessarily at the molecular level, because the exact mechanisms at the molecular level is different when you look at the different lizard species. So that's quite interesting. So we've seen how differences in morphs within a species in the experiments that we've talked about before could potentially lead to speciation, right? A study which looked at this further, a slightly nicer study, I've got to say, was done on fly catchers on the Solomon Islands by Ui et al. in 2009. Okay. And what they found was, on different islands, you find different morphs. So on some islands, you get individuals which are black with a copper belly, and on some islands, you get individuals which are just black. Okay. And it's been shown that this is due to changes in mutations in the MC1R gene. So what they did was they looked at a site which either coded for the amino acid aspartic acid or the amino acid aspar gene. Okay? And they looked on three different islands. They genotyped flycatchers on these different islands. So on Santa Island, where there's only black flycatchers, all the individuals were homozygous for aspartic acid, okay? On Makira Island, where individuals had a copper belly, all the individuals were homozygous for a spa gene. One which does put a slight spanner in the works is this Ugi Island here, where all the flycatchers are black, but there's a mixture. 50% of the birds are um, homozygous, for a spa gene, whilst the other 50% are heterozygous. <laughs> okay, so that suggests that there's more genes involved here, or more substitutions in the MC1R gene that are important here, but these are yet to be identified. They're still a mystery at the moment. Okay, so let's focus on these two islands then. So the next step was to do a behavioural experiment, a species recognition experiment, and this was to measure aggression. So what they did was is that they put stuffed birds on these islands and presented male birds to them, okay? And they measured the level of aggression. And to complement this, they also did playback experiments. So they played the calls of birds from different islands and they wanted to see how these flycatchers reacted. And what they found was, pretty conclusively, is that if the call played was from a bird of the same island and the stuffed model presented was of a colour of a bird from the same island, then you get more aggression, okay? Because the flycatchers are recognising it as a potential threat, yeah? A potential male threat which would want to mate with your females or take over your territory or something like that. And if the call was different, then there's less aggression. So you can see how these different aspects of the bird um, affect the level of aggression. So there's loads of different factors at play, but one thing is for certain is that the colour of um, the birds can definitely lead to speciation. Okay, that's all I've got time for. Hopefully next time we'll do something a little less dry. Oh god, I didn't say that, did I? Um, we're going to be looking at adaptive behaviour. Okay then, I'll see you next time.